Hey everyone, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and today we're discussing the new Oxygen show, In Defense Of, which explores the complicated relationship between notorious criminals like Timothy McVeigh and Ted Bundy and the lawyers who represented them. Joining me today are defense attorneys Chris Tritico, Dan Cogdell, and John Henry Brown. But before we bring them out, let's check out a clip. I was taking on the biggest criminal case in American history. I was asked to defend the life of the most hated woman in America. The devil was about to enter my life that wouldn't haunt me for years. To be a criminal defense lawyer, you have to adopt a philosophy that the justice of a society is measured by how it treats its worst people. Ted Bundy killed three women in Colorado and maybe more. Ted told me that he killed over 100 people. He's a defense lawyer. It's not for the weak hearted. You are the defender of the damned. He blocked the door and took my arms and shut me down. Miss Arias had killed him in a fit of rage. Timothy McVeigh was charged with using a weapon of mass destruction. He was facing the death penalty. There's been things that I haven't been able to talk about until now. When Tim told me exactly what he did and how he did it, I was absolutely shocked. When somebody says to me, how can you stand up for somebody like that? I say it's so that I can stand up for somebody like you. Clive Doyle survived the fiery last day near Waco. The moment I walked in, he had learned that his daughter had passed away in the fire. Most people don't want to listen to why David Koresh did what he did or why we followed him. Do I think if you represent the devil, you are the devil? No. What you give up when you take these things on is your family. We were working pro bono, meaning free. A mortgage payment balance, we were all going broke. Miss Arias threatened to ruin my career. I do believe the stress of it all is what led to my cancer. It almost cost me my life. Ted told me, you know the reason you've been my lawyer so long is because we're so much alike. And that was haunting. Everyone give it up for Chris Ritico, Dan Cogdell, and John Henry Brown. Thank you for joining. How are you, how are you doing today? Doing great. Good. Doing you came great. to New York on a good, hot day. Oh, yeah. This isn't this, hot. This is not hot. All right, all right. <laughs> They're from Texas. I'm We're from, from Washington. This is hot. Oh, good. This is hot yeah. for me. <laughs> so uh, we just watched a trailer for In Defense Of, and... I watched uh, your th three episodes that you guys are a part of, and I learned so much. And I think a lot of people will kind of get to see a different side of these trials that we never get to see before. So obviously, we saw in the trailer that these men have all gone to court, defended men who were presumed guilty probably by a lot of people from the get-go, and you had to jump in and still defend them. So before we get into each of the individual stories, why did you guys want to be a part of this documentary and share your stories? Well, when, when, when they called me about this, and I've been working with Magical Elves for a couple of years now on different projects, when they called me about this, this is the, this is the show that I've been looking for to get on the air because we, we tend to glorify uh, the prosecution side of, of, of our equation all the time in, in, in TV. We demonize defendants all the time. But never before have we taken the criminal defense side of this and looked at, taken a deep dive into it and looked at it from what we do and how we do it and what it does when you leave for five, six, seven months, leave your family, go 1,500 miles away and, and work on the hardest case that, that America has. And so finally, it, uh, this show gives the country a look into what it is to be a criminal defense attorney and what it means and, and from a perspective that the country's never gotten to see before. Absolutely. I mean, I agree with that. Uh, of course, the $150 a day we're getting for this is a big, <laughs> big play, too. But, You've got that much? Well, they're paying you more. <laughs> but, you know, people always want to demonize criminal lawyers. They want to view us as, as agents of, of, you know, the criminals themselves, and we're viewed as aiders and abettors. And we're, as I said in the piece, I've walked into restaurants and had people spit on me and throw drinks on me. And I mean, we are hated people, and 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 that's fine. None of us became criminal lawyers because we were the most popular kids in high school. <laughs> um, but I think it is important for uh, for a, a, an objective perspective to learn what lawyers 
go through when we're representing somebody who is hugely unpopular. It's it's an interesting process. Whether you hate us or love us, it's an interesting insight into, into, into you know, what the hell we do. Anything to add, John? Well, uh, I obviously, I, I agree with that. I, I think the concept for the show was really a great one. I agree. Um, and I've been asked to do a lot of other kind of things media-wise, and I turned a lot of them down. Mm -hmm. But this was the first time I'd ever heard this subject brought up. And I think, not only I think it was a great idea, I think Oxygen's done an amazing job. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I hope that people can see us in the real light. I, I, I just, uh, an anecdote, I was interviewed once and did a profile uh, for the New York Times when I was representing Sergeant Bales. And uh, I was in a trial and I was in a bad mood. And it was Friday night and I didn't get tired of these kind of things. So, but it was the New York Times. So um, the reporter says, why do you do this? I still have my briefcase on and stuff. And I said, pardon, I don't know if I could swear, but I said, it's my blinking path. And he said, that's not very romantic. And I said, it's not romantic. This is the hardest job in the world. Yeah. And, and so I think people need to know that. I mean, none, none of the people you're looking at right now do this for the money or the attention, although we get a lot. But it's usually, yeah, but it's, yeah, right. <laughs> but it's usually not favorable. So Chris, we'll start with you. Um, you took on the task of defending Timothy McVeigh, Vey, who was convicted of the Oklahoma City bombing. Right. Obviously a very, very serious story for a lot of people, really personal for a lot of people. <clears throat> And what I thought was interesting is that when you met with Timothy, he actually at first wanted to plead guilty, right? But he couldn't because it was a capital murder case. Well, you can't plead guilty to right. a death sentence. And so when right. the government has announced that they're going to seek the death penalty, you have to go to trial because uh, they're not going to allow a defendant to waive all of his uh, uh, constitutional rights and then go into a death chamber. And so at that point, you, you have no choice but to go pick a jury and go to trial. But I say that because you're going into the situation with a man who's sort of saying, I did it, but you still have to put together a plan to defend him. So what is your thought process, go process going in? Where do you even start with something like well, that? Well, our function is, is not to own what, what a, de a defendant did. And in this case, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't support blowing up a building. I don't support killing 168 people. And I've never tried to justify killing 168 people. And I, don't, I didn't then, I don't today. Our job is to put the government to the task and ensure that the defendant's rights, and in this case, Tim McVeigh's rights, are protected at the trial, and that the government can prove what they say he did. If they can't prove it, he gets to walk out the front door of the courthouse. In that case, it wouldn't have been with me, but he gets to walk out the front door of the courthouse, and, and because if they can't prove it, they, he gets to go home. The, in this case, they were always going to be able to prove it, and, and there was no, there was no, really no question about that. It was about, but our job is to ensure that his rights are protected, and and I can always live with that, regardless of, of what the facts are. And and that was the biggest criminal case in American history. But I was proud to take that on, and and and, and I'm I'm proud to take on any case, and stand tall and say prove it. And if they can't prove it, they get to go home. It's just that simple. But I'm sure it wasn't easy for you. You mentioned you were away from your young family for seven months. Uh, I left and I left on Valentine's Day, and I came home in July. Yeah. So, were you ever worried about your safety or the safety of your family? Because it's such a high-profile case. A lot of people are saying you're defending this murderer. What? But you're just a man doing his job. So, what were your concerns there? That I was time? never really concerned about my own personal safety. That really never, never bothered me any. Um, but I was concerned about my wife and kids. Uh, I was gone. I was 1,500 miles away. I had no idea what was going to happen with a case like this with so much national attention. The President of the United States called a press conference and said, we're going to execute this guy. The entire country hated him. And so I just had no idea what was going to happen. So we took whatever precautions we could at home mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, my wife and our kids were protected. Uh, and I, I, it, it really gratified me that not one time did I or my wife and kids ever have one negative word said to us by anyone, ever. Um, uh, and it was, it, it really, I'm, I'm, pr I'm proud of that, that, that in Denver where we tried the case and in Houston where my wife and kids were uh, the whole time, no one ever said anything negative. Now, I got some negative emails and, and, and stuff, but that, I can live with that. Um, but no one ever personally said anything. And that, that was really made me feel good about the country. Dan, you've had a different experience, right, with your case. So you represented Clive Doyle, who was a Branch Davidian during the Waco siege. And so that, again, was a very high-profile kind of controversial, controversial story. A lot of people wanted to throw a lot of accusations against these men. 
and you took on that case. So what kind of backlash did you have to deal with? You know, I didn't get a lot uh, of personal backlash in the Branch Davidian case per se. When I got into it, uh, actually I was asked to get into it uh, during the siege. These youngsters here don't appreciate this, but there was a siege of 51 days between the time that the ATF executed the search warrant and 51 days later when the tanks went in and the house went up in flames. And it was on national TV 24-7. I mean, you couldn't turn on a TV without seeing this this crazy house in Waco with all, with all these you know religious lunatics. In there. And Dick DeGaron, who's a hero and an icon and, and, a, and a friend of ours in Houston, he had asked me uh, to represent Clive Doyle, the fellow I ultimately did represent during the siege. And I'd just gotten married and had a big house, and I thought I was all that in a bag of chips, and I was getting good business. And I'm thinking, there's no way. I'm not going to go give up, you know, two years of my life for some crazy nut, you know, in, in, the, in the Texas plain. And uh, the fire happened, and then Dick asked me to go see Clive, and I said, okay. I'll go see him, but uh, no promises. I, 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 I bought into the hype, and, and the, the, the best way to get the worldview uh, of your clients to be a negative one is to label uh, their religion a cult. I mean, n name the, the, the most favorable cult impression you have. None of them are good. So the ATF and the FBI and the Rangers were all cult, 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 and I bought into that. And when I went to see Clive during or after the siege where he had escaped the fire, and I, I walked in, and I literally, he was handcuffed to the bed. He had been burned third degree over 80% of his body, and the screen crawler on the bottom of the CNN, scan, uh, CNN TV uh, screen crawler had revealed that his daughter passed away. I walked in, and he's on viewing the idea that his daughter has just passed away. And... Um, you know, after five minutes with the guy, he didn't know an AR-15 from a BB gun from an AK-47. And I, I thought to myself, I mean, this is why you become a lawyer. This is what, I mean, if you are going to be a criminal defense lawyer, this is the time. And if you're going to volunteer your time, this is the time. And if not now, you know, you're not worth a damn as a lawyer. So uh, I made the decision on the spot to represent him. And your outcome was different than John and Chris's because he was actually acquitted. Well, to be fair, I had facts. They didn't. <laughs> Uh, but yes, he was. There is that. So, but you say something really, I think, important in the documentary is that you say, you know, repping guilty people is a little easier because you're kind of working with certain facts. But when you believe that somebody's really innocent and you're trying to get this outcome, how does that change your approach or change well, your emotions with it? As we said the other night, I mean, the easiest job in the world is to be a shitty criminal defense lawyer, pardon the French. I mean, it's, it, you're guilty, pl sign the plea papers, get on with this, man. I got to go to lunch. Everybody knows you're guilty, take the deal. That's not hard, okay? What is hard is to represent somebody who you truly believe in. And if you're the, the most dangerous thing, I think, and most fearful, the greatest fear we all have is representing an innocent person. Because if we screw that up, that person's life has changed forever, permanently. I mean, they can spend the rest of their life in prison and that's get executed. Or get executed. And that, that's kind of a big deal. So Absolutely. And and John you defended uh, Ted Bundy. I tried. Yes. Uh, he seemed like a whole handful. Uh, oh, yeah. That, it was a really, really well done episode. I did not, you know, this all happened before I was born. I had little cliff notes about, but really kind of getting to see both sides of this specific case was really interesting. One thing that came out of your story was that the client lawyer confidentiality and the things that you are legally obligated to keep to yourself. Correct. So with Ted Bundy specifically, being aware of some of the things that he did, what was the challenge for you? Well, first of all, to answer, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. that, that Ted at Bundy actually gave me a release of the attorney-client privilege in writing. Um, because if I talked about him, even though he's dead, there, some people may think it's a violation of the privilege, but he gave me a, a, a waiver, which was interesting. But, um, you know, representing Ted, I mean, I think the important thing that the public needs to learn from this show is that we won't have a free society if they're not people like us. Um, and you talk about um, people being threatened. I mean, when I represented Ted, I get threats in the mail, because we had mail then. Um, and I only worried about them when they started spelling things right. Um, exactly. But when I was in Afghanistan four years ago representing Sergeant Bales, I actually got threatened by the Taliban. And they threatened me, and they threatened my family. And they basically said, you know, if you represent the devil, you are the devil. Uh, so there are people even in our society that feel that way. Uh, and so, you know, this job is not only hard from the standpoint of the tasks in front of us, and I agree completely, one of the, hard, the hardest one, emotionally, I think, is when you have a client that you know is innocent, 
because getting a fair trial for somebody who's innocent is not easy. And so uh, it, it, it's, it really drains you. I mean, this is a very difficult job. I go to law schools and talk students out of doing this job. And as I, I told the New York Times, it's my fucking path. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Um, but Ted was a challenge, to say the least. I mean, because he would change his personalities. He wasn't mentally ill. He was a sociopath, which is more dangerous. But he was, personalities would change. So I, I'd have to figure out when I went to see him one day, wh which Ted was he going to be? And I did get him to sign a plea agreement. You know, I got him to sign, I got a plea bargain for Ted Bundy. Nobody believed that was possible, but I did for four states and to save his life. And we were going to do it. We walked into court and as we're walking to court, he said, I'm not going to do it. And uh, so he was self-destructive to that extent. But I think he enjoyed the game more than he was. Yeah, he probably should have taken that deal. I'm, ju I'm just saying. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, after he committed a couple more murders, he ended up defending himself, right? Well, he did from time to time. Okay. You know, and that's. Well, the, I, I know, mean, like, he would. He would like, like inject. Watch I'm sorry. him. I what know. was it like for you to watch this man who you were trying to do the best for, kind of go off and defend himself and well, do something really? Well, I wasn't part of that scene except as a witness, actually, because after he turned down the plea bargain in Tallahassee, I, uh, Millard Farmer, and I, he's from Atlanta, and uh, talks like these guys. And, uh, and Millard says to Ted, uh, you know, Ted, John Henry and I only have so much time in this life, and we're going to spend it with people that want to live. Bye. But the and, answer uh, is it's like watching a train wreck. Yeah. So I, I told Ted at that point that I wasn't going to help him as a lawyer anymore. But after that, he still dragged me in some things, and I wrote some briefs, and then he wanted me to do his appeal, and I didn't. Um, so when he was representing himself in Florida, in Miami, uh, I was not his lawyer. There were public defenders who tried to do the best they could. Um, but he was sabotage. I mean, he thought he could fool anybody all the time. Uh, so that makes, that's a real challenge. And for each of you, it seemed like the jury in the cities you were in, the judge that you were given, what kind of role does that play in the case that you're able to put together? Because it seems like it would be impossible to, you know, have a jury that's unbiased with Timothy McVeigh. They had to change locations and things like that. Well, in, in the McVeigh case, we, we did get a change of venue from Oklahoma to, to uh, Denver, Colorado. And that was the reason we went to Denver was because we got the judge in Oklahoma recused and the judge that was appointed lived in Denver. <laughs> so there was little question where we were moving to. Um, but well, it didn't, Nobody in the United States didn't know. No, it Denver. didn't matter where we went. I mean, it, it literally didn't matter where we went. But Denver was a great place, and it was as good a place to try the case as any. You, you, there was nowhere in the country to go that, that everyone had not already formed an opinion. And so it, it, it didn't matter to me where we went. Um, and Judge Mage gave us um, all the time necessary to... Um, to voir dire the jury, or, or voir dire, as they say in most of the country, not in Texas. They don't. Know, nobody else in the country knows how to talk other than us. Um, to voir dire the jury, and 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 so I, you know, I, as far as I was concerned, he he did what he had to do to let us pick that jury. Um, there was a few things he did that I didn't appreciate, but other, but that's the way. That's the nature of trying cases, and and you know, you, there's rulings that are going to be made, and you live with them, and you worry about it on appeal. Um, the judge, the judge gets to make those rulings, and you move on. And if you if you can't hold your breath and turn blue and wait for him to change his mind, I had a little bit of different experience. Um, we the, the 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 venue in the in the Branch Davidian case was moved from Waco to San Antonio, which is the functional equivalent of moving the venue from the family room to the dinner table. Um, <laughs> not a lot of difference. Uh, judge Smith was a very pro-prosecution judge at first, uh, cut the legs out of us repeatedly. He was from Waco. He had his own very specific opinions about the Davidians, none of them which were good. And it was only about six weeks into the trial when I think even Judge Smith began to see that what the government was trying to sell wasn't, uh, wasn't anywhere near accurate, that the ruling started to change. And some of those rulings, a federal judge, as the old joke goes, the difference between God and a federal judge is, is God knows he's not a federal judge. I mean, federal judges are, are very powerful people, and most of them are very qualified, and most of them are very, very good judges, but they have an inherent amount of great power. And if they want to use it to their ends, they are certainly almost unbridled uh, in their ability to do that. And long story, not short at all, we started out with a biased, unfair judge. By the end of the trial, I think he was fair and objective and did what, what, what he thought was good, but it was, it was not easygoing. 
I, I found that same thing uh, to be true with, with judges in general, which is probably a good thing for us to say because people would probably think we, we disagree with judges more than we agree. But I find judges, as you go through a long trial, particularly if, if you're on the side that is somewhat righteous like he was, um, judges will come along. Um, that Not always. Now, the judge in the Bundy case in Florida was actually a very smart, very um, compassionate man. I, we all have probably seen the clip when he sentenced Ted to death and said, uh, I'm sorry you went through this because you would have been a really good lawyer and a really good person. And then he said, take care of yourself, son. Bye. Um, but Judge Cowart was his name, and he uh, suppressed all of Ted's statements. He suppressed the evidence. In other words, he was making defense rulings right and left. Now, people who are cynical say he did that because he knew that Ted would be convicted no matter what. I mean, who didn't know who Ted Bundy was and who didn't know what he was accused of doing? So Cowart knew that he was going to be convicted no matter what. So why give him appellate issues? I happen to take Cowart's side, and I think he made the decisions for the right reasons. But I don't know if it's, it's a little out of context, but we, the public needs to know uh, back during the American Revolution, the most hated man in the United, man in the United States was a lieutenant in the British Army, uh, a redcoat, who ordered the Boston Massacre. So he was the most hated man in the United States at that point. Who represented him? John Adams. John Adams, who two years later was elected president. Not only that, he got an acquittal. Won the case. And so um, that has always been an inspiration to us, probably. Um, but most Americans don't know that. Um, but, you know, I, I guess the credit to, to my career, basically, and maybe you gentlemen the same way, I have represented 17 law enforcement officers, who were, including three chiefs of police, who were charged with criminal offenses. I call them the new liberals. Um, but. That's a credit, I think, to my practice, because they didn't like me a lot when I was in court with them and doing battle with them. But then when they came to, got charged with crimes, they came to my door. I, every, every uh, I get that, judges, I represent a lot of judges now. You know? Prosecutors, so, even. even. Some prosecutors. Before we get out of here, I'm curious, you know, these, these three specific cases are well behind us at this point. When you guys look back, is it something you think about regularly? Is it something, is there anything you wish you could do different or? Is it just sort of closed? I, there's nothing I would do different in defending Tim McVeigh, if that's your question. I, I, I don't think there's any way that, that we could have tried that case any different, given the rulings that we had. And I certainly wouldn't do it any different. And I, I would take the case again today. If I had the opportunity to do it again, I would do it again today. No, I, I, I mean, Doyle was got the right result, so it's hard to have a hangover <laughs> about sure. that. Well, I, I think. Your case is an illustration. Um, judge uh, Kaczynski, who's the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals in California. No relation to Ted, by the way. Right. Um, he is one of the most conservative judges in the United States. And if you want to see something funny, just go Google his name, Judge Kaczynski, and you will see uh, a video of him yelling and standing up on the bench at a US attorney, a prosecutor, saying to that prosecutor, there's an epidemic of prosecution misconduct in this country and that the government is overreaching all the time. This is from a conservative judge who is so angry that he stood up on the bench and yelled at, I almost felt sorry for the US attorney, but that would be a stretch for me. Um, but people need to know that the government at times is totally out of control. Judge people Hanley, need to mother. know that we represent innocent people all the time. It's not, and that's how, I don't want to be known as Ted Bundy's lawyer. Right. I'd much rather be known as the lawyer who's helped develop the battered woman syndrome for all of the women in the world. Um, so, I, you know, it's just kind of the way it is. Absolutely. I think we have a couple audience questions. Uh, hi, uh, gentlemen. I'm sorry if this question is like you, if you've been asked it before and it comes off as redundant, <laughs> but uh, imagine that tomorrow you become the, one of the defense attorneys for the president of the United States. Bring your paycheck. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, like, what is your, uh, your approach then, if you're in the position of, of having to you representing Trump, yeah, okay. you can say the word. Yeah, you can you can say you can <laughs> say Trump in here. Like Voldemort. Yeah. Is, is, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so I, I'm curious uh, if you had to defend. I actually have thought about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, first of all, I tried to tell him to keep his mouth shut, which we tell all our clients. Um, but I, I think he really missed the boat, and I think it's because he's such a sociopath himself, probably. And that is, all he should say is, I deserve the presumption of innocence, just like everybody else. 
and he should say that over and over and over again, and that's all he should say. And I, I think it would work. I, I, the but first he wouldn't listen to me. The first thing I would do is fire Rudy Giuliani as my co-counsel. Yeah, I, I have no idea what that man is doing. The, the, the problem, though, as John Henry suggests, is client control. Um, parenthetically, the, the the prosecutor that will actually try the boots on the ground guy that will actually lead the the prosecution of the cases in court is a fellow by the name of Andrew Weissman, who I went up against in the Enron cases years ago. He's a very effective, very aggressive, uh, uber aggressive uh, prosecutor. And um, you, with particularly with a with a client like Trump, with a prosecutor like. Um, Weissman, you keep your powder dry. You don't air out your defenses and trot out what you're going to be doing two years from now. It's insane, and that's all we've seen is just this sort of focus group defense work among the masses. I've never seen anything like it. I agree 100%. Uh, we would not last uh, very long as Donald Trump's lawyers because he wouldn't listen to us, and, and, and I would have the same advice. You need to stop talking, and, and you need to be quiet and, 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 and stop aggravating everybody. And then I would be fired. And so if, if he hired me, I would make him write me a check, a very big check, immediately. And as soon as that check cleared, I would give him that advice, and he would fire me, and then I would go home. <laughs> That's why he has a good new answer. Part. <clears throat> One more question. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, if you were to redo or do your cases in today's society with, like, Social media as prevalent as it is, and the court of public opinion being so large, would you have changed? Would you change your strategy? Do you think that everything would have still turned out the same way? Well, for McVeigh, no. I mean, it would have certainly. I think that the polarization that we have in the country today, it would have been harder. I don't know. I don't know that it could have gotten any harder for Tim McVeigh, but with the polarization the way we are in the country, the way we're polarized, it would have been even harder on him to get a get a jury in the box. Um, but other than that, I don't, it would not have changed any result for Tim. You know, the, the problem that you have with any high-profile case, and I think for all of us, you know, high-profile cases around the office are called Thursday at this point in our career. I mean, it's pretty common to get involved in them. But social media adds a whole new twist to everything. It presents two problems. Number one, you know, how you cultivate that image. And number two, or change that image. And number two, how you do it without, in, you know, endangering yourself with a district judge. Because federal judges, they're going to shut your ass down on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. That's not going to happen. So I'm not sure in a federal case you'd be able to do much even with, you know, just the, 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 the overwhelming aspect of social media. Well, the sad answer to your question, I think, is I, I don't know if you gentlemen agree with me or not, but I think we have a lot less freedom uh, in this country right now than we had 20 or 30 years oh, I ago. Agree with that. I mean, it's kind of ironic, and I hope people don't take this the wrong way, but Osama bin Laden wanted to do two things in the United States. He wanted to destroy our economy, and he wanted to take away our freedom, and he accomplished both. Um, because we now live in a society that is much more paranoid, and for understandable reasons. But, you know, like Thomas Jefferson actually said, once you give up, uh, freedom for a little bit of security, soon you will have neither. That's Thomas Jefferson. And um, unfortunately, I think that's happening. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I think it's harder to get fair trials. Uh, I don't think any of us would do anything differently with our specific cases. But I think social media is one of the worst things that happened to the law profession. Because not only what they do to our clients, but, but the lawyers who advertise, and I see it all the time, it's embarrassing. Lawyers who just lie on their websites, so, I mean, social media has not been a great thing. For there, our there's people. a moron in Dallas whose who's, who's billboard says, attorney at war. Really, dude? <laughs> right. Seriously? You expect anybody to take you serious? I mean, it's just... That's the, come, but the 24-hour the, the, the aspect of, that social media has created with, with constant news coming in and out, and, and half of it not... And I, and I'm not going to use the, the fake word, but the, with the constant news coming out all the time, a case like the ones that we tried, it would keep that going all of the time. And so the, the public would never get a break. And when the public never gets a break, it feeds bad things, and that infects the jury panel. And when the jury panel, panel's infected, it, 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 it infects your ability to get a fair trial. Well, and social media was wrong, too, because everybody assumed O.J. Simpson was going to be convicted. I mean, and every talking head lawyer, I won't mention their names, and none of us are here, but every talking head lawyer said, well, O.J. Simpson is going to be convicted in 10 minutes. Well, if you tried a case in Los Angeles, which I have, and you knew it was downtown, you know you're going to have, you have two, Dan. people of color on that jury, you wouldn't say O.J. Simpson was going to be acquitted. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's wrong. Social media can just plain be wrong. Right. Apropos and to your question. that's what I'm saying. Apropos to your question, I think, uh, publicity is never my friend. And not, not, I mean, I've tried 350 jury trials one time, one time. Has publicity helped my defendant? Right. It's always a bad thing. And social media is just publicity on steroids. It, 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 the presumption of innocence, yeah, I got monkeys flying out of, flying out of my behind but, playing the but, but, ukulele. But I've known Dan Cogdell for over 30 years, and don't get me wrong, when there's a camera around, don't be standing in front of him and between him and that camera. Strong right. words from you, my friend. <laughs> Strong words. Thanks for your question. Well, this is like the law class that I should have taken in college, but I didn't. It's been really great talking to each of you. If you guys want to learn more about these famous cases and the people they defended, you can check out In Defense. It premieres on June 25th on Oxygen at 9 p.m. Eastern. Guys, give it up for Chris, Dan, and John. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you very much.